everybody. Welcome to another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy. This is Tim Jowsman. Joining me all the way on the East Coast, it is the Reverend Tracy. How you doing? I'm I'm doing pretty great, Tim. You know, I'm still mostly adjusting to the swamp level humidity that is Maine, but kind of like the heat in your Portland, the heat and humidity right now is actually not really normal you know, for, for Maine this time of year uh, and spinning up and uh, reading that I guess Maine or at least Portland, Maine might be having some indoor mask requirements. I think they're intentionally avoiding the term mandates, but, um, but it, it kind of read like they're considering a mandate. Uh, it didn't super affect me though, because I'm already wearing masks in stores so (laughs) i guess i will just continue with business as usual but uh how about you guys yeah it's kind of the same thing here in portland um in oregon period the governor did come out and state that um she is stating that people should wear masks whether you are vaccinated or not especially outside if you are outside in a spot to where you cannot properly social distance like if you're at a big park and it's just you for you know yards and yards around and nobody's near you that's that's one thing you know enjoy your mask off but you know if you're at a place like in Chicago with Lollapalooza you know that was at Hyde Park and you know about three people wore their masks that day you know thankfully it was shown I guess it wasn't a super spreader so I guess that's good but um, you know it's it's just be safe just be safe if people just followed the instructions on on this pandemic to begin with and weren't worried about their rights you know um and it's funny too that the people arguing about you know their rights their body are usually the ones telling women that they don't have rights to their body (laughs) and need to have all all the kids that that people force upon them but different story different day i guess you know yeah well i mean i think i had even gotten kind of clap back or quippy you know I, i try not to make posts that initially would just stir people being mad Mm -hmm. but it did kind of crack me up because um and i don't think like a lot of my friends don't listen to this i don't think i'm going to cause a fight by pointing out that i do have (laughs) friends who have different points of view on things and um have had different points of views on things for a while so i think it's kind of interesting that the same people that i see making posts about you know essentially how dare they discriminate against me for not being vaccinated yeah. are the same ones that kind of seem to have this opinion against the lgbtq community that if that baker doesn't want to bake your gay wedding cake they shouldn't have to so I, I can't help but be a little amused. I didn't have the balls to like just come at somebody directly about it. So I went passive aggressive and posted it on my Twitter, you know, because that's what the cool kids do. But it, it just kind of made a valid point. It was interesting because other people had responded to that. Like, yeah, it is kind of the same people, isn't it? But yeah, I don't know. I've, I've seen this ridiculous thing where uh, it's supposed to sound like you're being very intelligent about questioning the vaccine requirement and what it is is it's asking um you know you can turn around it's let me start that over it is a suggestion that if perhaps somebody were to ask you for proof of vaccination that maybe you could just hammer them with a bunch of asinine fucking questions Like if you can see the vaccine card of the person who will be your server tonight, and can you also see their most recent drug test and also this thing and this thing and this thing and their criminal record, their background check, like, uh, that, that, that's the thing that I saw that just made me go, yeah, that's kind of dumb. I I don't know how well that would go because I, I, (laughs) I don't know if like a restaurant would have that information on hand. I mean, other than the vaccine record, they actually might. And then wouldn't you feel kind of stupid? Like, well, actually we do keep them like right up front because that's a valid question during a pandemic. Yeah. The problem though, is that in times like this, the people that get the brunt of this nonsense, the most are going to be in the service and retail industry, people that cannot, you know, re you know, put these people back in their place. You know, I think a couple months back when that former eighties child star, Ricky Schroeder, um, who I guess is a conservative activist now um, went to Costco and started harassing one of the managers at Costco about their mask thing. And it's just like, I can, and I said it before, 
on a show. I can disagree with his take on that, but the moment he goes to just a regular person doing their nine to five job and treating them like garbage and not going to like Costco headquarters to do that, it just shows he wants to be an asshole. It's it's just about, you know, his, his in, he's been inconvenienced because he has to put a little tiny cloth on his face. But, you know, just, just people are assholes. People are just assholes. <laughs> so anyway. Oh, yeah. There was actually, um, there was an article that I saw on my little news feed that was addressing how retail and service people are just being treated horribly. I mean, little thing out there, if you want to be one of those good humans, uh, that treats them kind of really well, you know, the smallest and most awesome thing you can do to that service industry person. What is that? Call them by their name. Mm-hmm. They, they legitimately have a name tag usually, and it says it. And there's even been times I've had funny conversations like, well, your hair is beautiful. I'd say hi, like personally, but it's kind of covering <laughs> your name tag. You know, it, it's just a nice way to rehumanize them because I mean, we have a really big worker shortage here in Maine. Uh, I I don't know if it's as obvious in other places because, for example, none of the fast food places are actually open to the late night hours like they're supposed to be. Like they're all rolled up by nine. And it is legitimately because no one will take those jobs. And here I am, a human who could totally have a part time job during the day, by the way. I wouldn't do that by choice right now, just because of how horrible people are being to service people for just doing what people told them to do, like way pay grades above them. Like they're not the ones insisting on the masks in stores, guys. Uh, No more than they're the ones that decided, you know, no shoes, no shirt, no service. Like that came from somewhere totally different. And it really stinks to see people being treated in such a way like, for whatever it is. Anyway, I might find that article. I, I It's in my tags to read later. So if it's interesting <laughs> enough, maybe I'll share it to the nerd them. Yeah, yeah. Pl- plenty going on with the pandemic. So, um, and I know with, um, th- uh, we, we're, we're going to be ta- uh, touching upon this a little bit later too, when we do talk a little bit about um, the Jeopardy host situation, because that does kind of uh, tie in a little bit to um, vaccines. And uh, we'll, we'll go into that there. Now, before we get into the show proper here, I did want to bring up, uh, we do have a Discord. I've dusted off our Discord and would love to get some uh, activity in there again because I think that you know could lead to some fun fun times I guess if uh, we do get some people over there but I don't want to do what another podcast did to me um, you know to kind of get an idea of what other podcasts are doing with their discord servers um, I, I've joined a couple um, not many but just a couple popping in seeing what they're doing there's one I joined and I'm not going to say the name of, uh, of it or anything but you know I said hey my name is Tim from friends talking nerdy podcast blah 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 hit send and then, and then within a couple of minutes the admin of the board sent me a personal message stating we didn't like it if you uh mention your podcast because blah 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 and it's like okay i don't need to be here then bye and and on the one hand i can kind of get it if you're creating a community of something and you have someone just popping in spamming you know like come to visit my thing you know that's like if you have a gas station and the guy who owns a gas station across the street is trying to get your customers on the one hand i get that but you know take a look at our facebook group you know there's i know one person has another podcast anthony steves um one of the co-hosts of the capeless crusaders and in our facebook group advertises the show but he also contributes to the conversation. That's cool. I got no problem with that, you know? So, um, yeah, we do. So having said that, we're not, we're not trying to steal your followers. Uh, there's a lot of people looking for content to entertain themselves. You know, we were over a year speaking of the Mm -hmm. elephant in the room that is the pandemic. People have kind of run out of Netflix and Hulu and as much as there's some awesome content coming out, you know, there's still more space for humans who were used to, you know, a certain way of life in what I call the before times. I very affectionately refer to it as the before times. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It seems kind of odd and like um, like it was very reactionary. But who yeah. knows? I mean, they may have had others come in, blast about their podcast and then leave. So it could be that they had a bad taste in their mouth. I'm only just now getting into Discord. Uh, I discovered there's a main Pokemon Discord. So <laughs> Discord's just kind of fun in general. Um, 
it's been kind of cool. I need to get better about it, but it is kind of like having a conversation like ongoing with us. So if that, uh, if that draws you come and join us. Yes. Professor Aubrey is there routinely. Uh, my sister who is, has her own, uh, podcast on the friends talking nerdy podcast network, uh, their voices, she pops in there every now and then. So again, we would love to get that up and, uh, going as well. I know we can even reach out to Wendy cause we do have, uh, some future plans on the show involving her, you know, so, um, we can definitely uh, do that, but, It'll be in the show description. Uh, check out our Discord. And I know the Reverend now has an important recruitment message for us. What do you have to say? Are you in the Portland, Oregon area? Are you at least mildly drawn to creepy shit? Do you have an interest in makes it, making somebody cry, scream, or possibly pee themselves? I would love to invite you to shoot an email to me at fearlandiacasting at gmail.com to just explain your interest in haunt work. Um, we are looking for people who have prior experience in either some type of performance that can be acting, stand-up comedy, or if you have done haunt work before, that's obviously super relevant. Um, we are still looking for some roles for main casting roles. Uh, you know, just like with any other type of performance, we have main roles and then supporting roles. And so we are looking for people who are available for most of the time. Um, um, you know, because you get to repeat it, you get to work with the cast, you get to really fine tune that position. So uh, that one is a little bit of a selective thing. We are looking for people with prior experience. We also do have a volunteer list. So if you don't have prior experience and you're still really interested in possibly making somebody pee themselves, you can still totally reach out and then we can get you more on that volunteer style list, um, a little bit lower key. So you might not be a main character, but you're still probably going to get to have some fun and scare the sometimes literal shit out of people. Uh, yeah, so and I know Tim is gonna put that email address in our description too. So fret not if you didn't catch it, but it is fearlandiacasting at gmail.com. Yes, and wouldn't that be better than a paycheck just making people pee and shit themselves out of fear? That would be awesome. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, very honestly, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned on the show, I am a weenie. I have never even been into a haunt myself. And I've honestly worked with other people who have like anxiety or PTSD, and they find it incredibly empowering. Mm -hmm. So I am a big advocate of of. There's a, it takes all sorts of folks to make that work. And every year so far that, you know, I've been working with these guys, it's been really awesome and very familial. Like it, it's not as, um, not as aggressive as some of the other acting situations that you can be in, but yeah. And, and by performance experience, I mean, everything from stand up to acting in theater. I mean, if you want to convince me that you have performance experience for a main role, you shoot that email to me and knock yourselves out and we'll probably have a cool conversation either way. Well, there you go. And that's uh, the thing about the arts. Too. I mean, the only way you're really going to get involved in the arts is if you do have that networking experience. So this is a nice way to get your foot in this door for uh, Portland, Oregon um, type uh, for the Portland, Oregon art scene here. So check our uh, show description for more information. And uh, like we both mentioned um, in the show description, if you are indeed interested, it's just a, a tap of a finger. You're going to be heading straight to your email and you can shoot the reverend. In email. Now, speaking of people that do, someone that may be looking for a job now, um, Mike Richards. <laughs> he had the show for a day, um, the host of Jeopardy. And um, word came out that um, he had a podcast like we do. Um, but in 2013 and 2014, um, he had a podcast that was out in on that podcast. There were um, some jokes made that didn't sit well with people. So he finally saw the writing on the wall and um, made the decision to uh, resign. Um, in the meantime, on a temporary basis, um, you know, I think the last time we spoke, we didn't, uh, there was not an official word yet. So, um, the, you know, for people 
people that may not realize um the sony did determine that um producer mike richards would take over the host of the syndicated uh, host show of jeopardy uh what you usually see after your evening news um you know with your grandmother or something like that and then um they also hired uh dr maya bialik for um primetime specials as well as a potential spin-off uh series so um you know like i mentioned she is going to be the interim host of the um of the syndicated show going forward so they are in the market again for a new host for the syndicated show did mike richards even get to host one i mean i don't have live tv oh he did he got to host just one (laughs) uh well he recorded um i believe a day or two now when they record on uh when they record jeopardy one day of recording is five episodes so um you know he's gonna have about a week maybe two weeks worth of content uh filmed but um again that's gonna be it and and obviously it's material already filmed so they're going to use and you know i think you know i don't think the controversy is that bad that you know they're gonna shelf that but um you know it's 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 tough on them but you know sony did make the process a lot tougher um on themselves i did find out you know even though um we did uh have the, even though we did state uh the last time we spoke about this that you know ultimately sony was behind the, deci- the decision the head of sony in terms of who had the jeopardy post i did find out that you know as executive producer mike richards did have some say in the scheduling for the guest host and um it was interesting that he was the second of the guest host that started out and when um lavar burton fan favorite um was was the guest host on the show do you remember when that was i do not because i didn't watch it the start the start of the olympics <laughs> Ooh, low blow see it just kind of goes back to that dumb story that i made up of like it was his dream since he got involved with jeopardy to somehow be a host and that this was how he would make it happen but yeah i remember seeing like that article come out that he stepped out i was like well shit that was fast yeah and um yeah it's i it, it, you would think i mean it's like he knew he had that podcast and 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 to be clear the content that was said on the podcast i didn't hear it myself so more than likely it's a situation of you know angry people today listen to the podcast and took some jokes that may have been off colored and then presented it as if they are worse than they potentially are i'm not in no way because again haven't heard the jokes, so I can't speak to them. Um, but more than likely, it's probably just oh, something that's really overblown. <laughs> you know, if, if I had to get that's not defending the yeah. guy at all. I'm not trying to um, rationalize what he said. But you know, we have to admit here that you know, when people do get the pitchforks on social media, um, things can at times, you know, like, oh, no, he didn't tip his waitress 15%. That son of a bitch, you know, he's against yeah. America. And then it kind of turns into that headline, you know, the the triggering headlines, because let's be real, I'll use the term because that's what they're doing. A lot of headlines are being built to trigger people. Uh Um, But it's kind of interesting to me that he didn't seem to fight it at all. He didn't seem to justify it. He's like, okay, I got it. I'm canceled. I'm done. Um, Which is odd to me. I actually find that more odd. Then if you had said, you know, it's been 2013, we're, co- we're coming up on I'm 10 years older, like any any explanation of growth or any other explanation for the jokes, you know, it's kind of like uh, John Cleese, which is somebody that you and I have talked about somewhat recently. He's got that whole quote that I absolutely love about when you're writing a joke, you have to think, are smart people going to get that this is a joke and that it, it that it's a good joke? Or a few dumb people going to overreact to it and focus on the wrong parts of it. And to which he had said, and I'm very much paraphrasing this quote, guys. But at the end of it, he just kind of left it as, well, I'm sorry, stupid people. There are just certain disadvantages to being stupid. So that being said, I would be curious. I haven't gone out of my way um, to listen to whatever these jokes were. But I am curious of, is it an actual misogynistic person? Or is this someone making jokes about the fact that misogyny exists? Because that's where I feel like there's a little bit of miscommunication in the com- in the comedy world and then everybody else. Uh, there is a huge difference between acting as a court jester, 
which is you're making fun of the fact that it's real. That's kind of that role versus you're making jokes to perpetuate the stance. And I could see where those would have like a really big fuzzy gray line between them, but I have not gone out of my way to listen to him. Yeah. And, and let's be clear too. Let's, I mean, it, it, like some of the things apparently he said were misogynistic as well as uh, racist, so um can't definitively say it without hearing the jokes in question but um so it, but uh, you know for him quitting i think he realized that you know he doesn't have a big name you know so i think with believe it or not um with um th- with the publicity already as bad as it is on that show i think he was smart enough to realize that um you know there was no way he was going to be able to stand this so i think he did the right thing now mike richards hasn't quit jeopardy he still has that executive producer job so he's still working on the show for now for now i'm um, just throwing that out there because this is just broken right so we gotta yeah. see what's going to happen and maybe that's why he stepped down so fast mm-hmm. was almost thinking well maybe if i step down from this it'll take some of the heat off but i don't know because now that we've opened that box and we know that there's some junk in there i could totally see people starting you know hashtag boycott jeopardy <laughs> until he's fired. Um, But again, it goes back to this was 10 years ago coming up, right? Like this was in 2013. And I'd like to think as much as I know I've even grown and other people I know of that have grown in the course of just this pandemic, which was just an interesting thing to go through. I've grown a lot in 10 years and I do like to have the belief that other people grow too. Like there's jokes I made 10 years ago. There's no way in shit I would make them now because (laughs) I've grown as a human. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I'm curious to see how this continues to play because I have a sneaking suspicion it's not done yet. And plus, I guess Mayim... Um, Mayim Bialik, yes. Yeah. Bialik, 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 <laughs> Bialik. I need to practice these things and stop copping out and giving up on saying names that are hard. Mayim Bialik also has some of her own controversy, which yes. you know, some of it I had kind of heard before uh, about birth control and things like that. And uh, I did actually take a side step to look into that. And I found it interesting. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time digging in. I'm going to put a little asterisk on this <laughs> statement. But what I did find was that she did apparently do like a podcast or an episode with Ricky Lake and somebody else talking about the effects of over prescribing birth control pills and how, you know, she's a neuroscientist. So she is very much talking about what it does to your meat computer when these things are happening and how it's affecting women. And I believe that I know a lot of female bodied that have a lot of hormonal issues. And many of us were put on the pill kind of early for, for legitimate reasons too. Um, But yeah, so, but you had something related to vaccines with her. Yeah. um, Where there was a mother Jones article I came across about this and it um, basically, there are people that are upset that she got the hosting gig because she has to put it based on how the article put it, she has expressed skepticism about vaccines. And that's important that, that the, the skepticism is the important word here because how I read it is that, she isn't the type of person that is that would necessarily rush to get a vaccine right away, you know, because some people uh, misunderstand skepticism. You know, some people that are skeptics um, are going to be skeptics no matter what, you know, the, uh, unless it, it, it uh, goes along with their confirmational bias, you know, they're going to be skeptical and they're not going to listen to anything. Um, but people that are just skeptical of, you know, major corporations, you know, that may t- cut some corners. I mean, look at uh, with the, the coronavirus and the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that was temporarily taken off the market for um, some side effects that were happening to percentage wise less people than um, I guess that that effect of women that are on the pill, you know, but they still took it off the market. So um, my understanding, again, is that her skepticism is, um, you know, just uh, of the kind that I want to make sure that if I do get this vaccine, it's going to be right for me. Now that, and even that attitude, I would say is probably not 
as healthy but again i don't i know i didn't get the impression on the article that she was ex- expressly like a jenny mccarthy i am 100 against vaccines but the fact that she's not coming out wholeheartedly stating vaccines for everybody get a vaccine at my house or something like that all of a sudden she she represents the the anti-vax crowd and um that's that's just another thing that i don't like about modern culture people like she hasn't expressly said this so she must be for it Oh my gosh, they're not excessively drinking my Kool-Aid in agreements with me. So they must be on the bad team, right? It's almost like the same thing I complain about with red versus blue with politics. Like, oh, you have a blue sticker? Well, get the fuck on that side of the room and I don't give a shit what you have to say. Um, Yeah, there is difference, a huge difference between having what I would call healthy skepticism Mm -hmm. and saying, no, I'm not going to do this. There is a huge difference. Like I really love, you know, on Facebook with the little borders or whatever the frames you can add. Yeah. I've seen a lot more of it lately. It's like, I have a, uh, what is it? I have a healthy distrust of authority and I still got vaccinated. <laughs> like it is one of the current ones I've seen that I've been a little bit in love with because I do consider myself to have some healthy reluctance. Um, I, I think I've even talked about it on here. Um, not really big. If a doctor is going to try to prescribe me something, I mean, I do get that they are the medical professional, but I do also understand way too much about how prescription medication works and some of the deals, like there's a reason they have samples guys. It's not just because, uh, <laughs> they, they want to be able to give stuff for free. There are some like practitioners that'll kind of use those samples to help people out, but you know, those representatives come and give samples for a product for them to use with their patients, Uh which, you know, some people have more of a client mentality towards their patients, but the proper one is a patient mentality towards patients, trying to heal them, make them better, not trying to push something because somebody came and gave you, you know, some samples and that there is some sort of offer that they want to make you if say you prescribe this thing more. I don't know. I'd love for stuff like that to be looked into. So that's where I'm skeptical. I, I will totally take that extra time and look into things. Um, But that doesn't mean I don't ever see a doctor. It doesn't mean that I don't ever take prescription pills. Um, I I try to do a lot of natural things, but it doesn't mean I'm a never person because it's amazing at me living my life the way I do and just saying, you know, I try to do this naturally. How often I get hit, you know, you should really consider taking a prescriptive medication. I'm like, yeah, I did. And I chose not to. Because, see, I can actually make well-informed decisions based on the, like, there's so much knowledge at our fingertips that we can go and look up, you know? You can totally research and make informed decisions. That is one beautiful thing about America. Like, you can't do that in some other countries. Like, China... You know, it's super iffy what you're going to end up pulling back in search results, and especially, you know, all, all over the country, there's more restrictions than here. Um, as, a, as much as that can be a blessing and a curse, uh, I choose to look at it that way. And the thing with, with Mayim, I will say, is she is a neuroscientist, not an immunologist. So I am kind of cool with her voicing some skepticism on this because she's not going to be the person I listen to at the end of the day. Yes. It's not her expertise. And then if you are one of those people that says that their, their skepticism comes because it came together too fast, it came together too fast. Well, you know what the bright and shiny, awesome fucking part of that is? It came together fast because a lot of very up and working immunologists around the world actually recognize the importance of this. And because we have the ability to work together across wherever the fuck you are remotely, they came together to work on this. So uh, I honestly think it is a great story, although I'm super happy that I got the Pfizer shot, which apparently did get the FDA seal of approval, because again, I did take a minute and try to research the difference between what they were doing between Moderna and Pfizer. And I actually knew I didn't want the Johnson and Johnson, uh, uh-huh. the one shot one because of the efficacy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that, that information is totally out there to make informed decisions. And I hope, that she has at least talked to that level as well in talking about her skepticism. Yeah. Now, of course I'll, I'll put it out there. If anybody listening to this has other information that, you know, contradicts what, what we said, by all means, send it our way. I'm not trying to defend her or, you know, stating she's right. You know, it's just that, you know, I, I do, I, I, what bothered me more than anything was the fact that, you know, again, people are instantly hating her and, 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 and it's like, 
I, I, a lot of this is because LeVar Burton didn't get the job. You know, people are upset about that. Now, um, who knows if he will get it? Because I have read an article that the new person that they're moving on to, that is the person's job to lose, is that Ken Jennings guy, the 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 guy who won like the most on Jeopardy. Um, and um, I guess he was the first guest host as well uh, on it. So another white guy is going to get the job. Um, but, um, you know, it, 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 it the Jeopardy folks did everything wrong they possibly could uh, this this go around. And, um, I you know, I don't think they've hurt the long-term damage of the show. I mean, I think Jeopardy is open enough. Uh, it, it's it's a concept enough that I think within six months, I think people are going to forget about. It. I mean, because look, if if we have if within six months you get like half the population in this country that forgets that Republicans started an insurrection, I think they're going to forget that you know Levar Burton didn't get Jeopardy. But um, who knows if it if it um, you know did some long-term damage. I I mean, I, I don't know if it uh, maybe Jeopardy isn't like, going to be like the top rated game show anymore. I just don't think Jeopardy's going away because of this. But they also didn't help themselves by doing but because this, this was just all unnecessary, you know, especially doing the whole year of guest host only to come back to a guy that worked on the show you know just appearances alone just you know appearances alone it would make anybody say really really yeah that's almost as bad as like a government official uh getting financial compensation because of a contract that the united states postal service gave to a company they get money from what what sorry um, um. Sorry, that's, <laughs> we're not talking about that again. We <laughs> talked about that last time I was on. Oh, but, we do uh, have uh, that. That I, I did have the. I, I forgot. Thank you for bringing that up because I forgot ooh. to <gasps> bring up the addition. Now, I, last time we talked about that, I had brought up a, a law that Congress had put in the place that hobbled the post office, and uh, Professor Aubrey reminded me what that was. Congress made it to where the United States Postal Service had to fully finance each and every employee's retirement fund fully, which no company does. And yet the post office was made to do that. And they have to have it in a bank account at the end of every year, which has severely killed their budget. Yeah, it really stinks. Um because I, I, whenever I was there, one of these last times I had seen this sign and I do apologize if I had already said this. <laughs> I did think it was interesting though, that they had this little flyer. I was like, did you know the United States Postal Service does not receive any taxpayer money? And I'm like, I think it's cute that you're trying to spin that as a positive. Uh, but I guess what it's supposed to do, the sign was kind of supposed to be uh, almost reframing it. It seems it's like, this is why we are free to make choices and da da da. I'm like, yeah, but you also have like a worker shortage and you're having yeah. problems and like guaranteeing, I guess, retirement and stuff like that. And like some real problems with your customer service because I hate to say it, but oh my gosh, the uh, treasure box that I mentioned making for my stepdaughter only just got to her. Oh. And uh, it was an entire mess. I thought they lost it. I just, it kept going back and forth to two distribution centers across the country. And I get it. Like I, they don't really have like full bore customer service because they don't even have full bore, like people filling the roles, the physical roles they need, like in the offices and things like that. So they, they are struggling, but yeah. I, I feel bad because I don't think I could send like important packages to them again. Not for a little bit. I need a break. I guess is what I'm saying, but a mental break, know, yeah. <laughs> postcards and stuff are still good. So we can still send postcards and things and support them in general. But yeah, it's, it's interesting being a constitutional right, throwing that out there that the United States Postal Service is something that is in our constitution, but none of the taxpayer dollars goes to support this thing that's supposed to be something that we have it's supposed to be a guaranteed right for us to have this service and it's just interesting to watch it slowly be tanked and certain parts be contracted out to private entities 
Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, uh, and and the, the fact that the the American public are sitting on their hands, not doing anything, because again, you know, last time we talked about this, we brought up, I mean, how many people have eBay businesses? How many people have Etsy businesses? You know, how many podcasts have have you know trinkets that they make that they send out to their listeners and whatnot that will be severely affected by this? There are tons of people that are going to be severely affected by um, the post office continuing what it does or continuing on on with its downslide and if the post office were to ever go away or be be privatized i mean that uh, i i wonder what that would do to the economy more than anything because a lot of people are going to be hobbled oh yeah and then the two major competitors ups and fedex will have no reason to even compete with those prices anymore so then they can start setting prices pretty much without taking it into consideration because right now it's like oh for a little bit more Mm -hmm. you can use us well if there isn't now a little bit more for them to balance it off of it might turn out into a lot a bit more and i did think it was interesting i learned that the united states postal service is actually going to add additional fee for sending things during the holiday seasons which is something that they had traditionally very proudly said they would never do unlike fedex and ups so yeah that's an interesting change because on one hand it's showing that they're trying to act like a competitive service but on the other hand i just don't think they have the quality to demand that because the boxes sometimes whenever you send things flat rate are just mangled like i i don't understand i guess they kind of dump truck style it so instead of you whereas you know a lot of places tend to use pallets and moving yeah. they still just like dump it like a pile of bricks so and that goes back to though they aren't being given the resources and they don't always have the money to buy the resources they need in order to treat things a certain way so it goes back to support them where you can make wise decisions and uh, hopefully we don't lose the post office because you know what guys i want us to be a podcast that's big enough to have trinkets and i want the postal service to send those out cheaply and effectively for everybody so <laughs> damn right hashtag also support our podcast <laughs> there you go there you go Now, there are some new shows out there that you have been watching. Tell the folks at home what they are. So I will start with the one that I actually have been watching because the other one just came out today. So I believe the Mr. Reverend, excuse me, and I will start watching that tonight. But this one has already been on, I think, four seasons now. Um, And yeah, they're they're they just started releasing, I think, their fourth season. I had never seen it before until it popped up on Netflix. It is a little show called Atypical. And Atypical is following an 18-year-old character named Sand Gardner, who is on the spectrum. And I fell in love with the show immediately. I am very big on shows that help understand and even normalize, you know, mental health and some of the struggles with it and some of these diagnoses so you know working on getting a better understanding of people with autism Mm -hmm. is something that I am a big proponent of Uh, my nephew was born back then they called it mild autism so when he was diagnosed there wasn't really the term on the spectrum but I have a nephew who is on the spectrum and um, I've met a few people who are and it seems very, very well put together. Um, it is directed by somebody, he didn't really seem to have a background. Um, you know, I kind of expected like, oh, well, maybe this is a uh, somebody who's there or whoever has autism and that's not the case. But they did work with um, a professor. I'm trying to find the name now. So of course I've lost it. But uh, (laughs) they uh, have worked with the professor that has helped with a lot of studies on autism because they did really want to be as accurate as they could be. And I love it because it's following a lot of the inner monologue of this character. And so it's actually explaining like some of the ticks and triggers and some of the things going on, you know, the person on the bus that's rocking and saying like four words over and over again. 
And in his head, he'll be having clear dialogue with uh, those viewing it about, you know, whenever I get stressed, I list the four types of penguins in Antarctica, because that's his thing. He really loves like Antarctica and the penguins and discovery and stuff there. So right. you'll see that he has that as an, a theme for a lot of his coping mechanisms and things like that. Uh, even kind of goes into how support groups can just be kind of weird sometimes and a little bit toxic even and uninviting to new people. Um, some of the stuff within a family where it can be really stressful, things like that. Um, I did want to put out there, I did think it was really cool. One of the supporting actors named Christopher, who you do you know, run into within the first season, he does actually have autism. Hmm. So I think it is very cool to show that because there's a lot of assumptions out there about people with autism and there's actually a lot of them he points out, but yeah, it's like, of course they can work. It, it kind of goes back to whenever the actress on Glee with, uh, I believe it's down syndrome that she has, but people were really, really surprised. See, I was like, well, of course, mm -hmm. like they're not. Yeah. They're, again, it goes back to, there's a lot of assumptions made about certain diagnoses. Um, people with autism can do therapies and learn ways to deal and learn how to function in society. And it's very much what the show is about. I think it is beautiful. It's up on Netflix right now. If you're looking for something to binge, highly recommend Atypical. Nice. And there was another one here. It looks like it was a Bob Ross documentary. And I saw that too. And I did read a little bit about that. And I guess, uh, he didn't have a happy life, apparently. Well, I mean, it, uh, it's kind of interesting, though, right? Because I know in running with the limited amount of artists I've ran into, <laughs> I've had a lot of conversations that tend to steer towards, you know, do you take serotonin reuptake inhibitors or do you do therapy? You know, so I, I don't know much about the life. I'm super excited to learn because Bob Ross is something that is a bit of a positive memory. When I was a kid, my brother and I all through high school, even I recall, we would go upstairs and watch Bob Ross after school and sometimes just like take a nap, like just we'd be on the floor watching Bob Ross and sometimes pass out. Right. But <laughs> he's very calming. Um, but I guess this is more about it sounds like some controversy that happened after he died, possibly mm. to do around the ching ching, getting that money um, with, I, I guess he's got a son uh, who got a little bit involved, but see, I, I didn't want to spoil too much about it for myself since it's just now coming out. I want to discover this as a whole. So I kind of gleamed the article, but I guess the overall that they wanted to put out there is like, yes, it does cover some of the dark stuff, some of the financial obligation to things, and a little bit of the greed, but that it's still going to leave you kind of feeling good about good old Bob Ross and some fondness and memories. So I am very excited to sink my teeth into yet another documentary that kind of is going to open up some shit that maybe I missed whenever I was a kid or something, um, or at least just explaining something that was in my world. Cause it is kind of interesting to learn like, yeah, Bob Ross was just this very calm guy who painted the trees and you would follow along and then you'd make a little home for the bunnies. Um, you know, that's how he talked, except, you know, I'm not even trying to mimic him properly. I, I wouldn't yeah. dare, but you know, he's got <laughs> a very soothing voice and to learn like some of the interesting other sides of his world. I don't know. I find that incredibly interesting. Are you going to watch it? I know you're more like into explosions and bam and kapow and superpowers. So I didn't know if this was anything that was going to pique your interest. Um, no, I'm not going to watch it. Um, Bob Ross was never my thing. Honestly, I don't even recall ever seeing any of his shows on the air when they originally ran. Now, um, for Bob Ross fans, um, a lot of those apps like Pluto TV, um, Plex has their own like live TV streaming type service. Bob Ross has his own channel. So, um, you know, you can watch the Bob Ross painting show all you want, you know, for hours on end now. But um, th yeah, just, he, it, you know, he never caught my eye when he was originally out. So um, I don't know if I would watch it. I know a lot of folks, um, you know, I, I, if anything, I think he's like 
a more current version of what Mr. Rogers was for some people, you know, and just that calming, you know, like, especially for young people, um, like you, you explained it yourself, just having that calming voice, you know, sometimes after school, even if it was so calming, it made you nap, it was still associated with a good positive feeling. So um, you can't go wrong with that. But you know, is it up my wheelhouse? Not really. Yeah, I get you. He, uh, I could see him being that almost Mr. Rogers for adults. Because if you think about it, if you do paint along with him, he's just tricking you into painting therapy, into art mm-hmm. therapy. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he, I, I'm, I'm excited to learn about it and see what all happened there. Because it goes back into, I don't dig in to this stuff normally. So I'll be very curious to learn more about his life. And I do kind of hope they go into that sort of side of it if it exists you know what i mean like if he really got into art as a a means of self-therapy and self-healing uh those are the stories i also love to learn about but yeah and i i I would be shocked yeah i mean i don't think he did the show for like his gambling debts or you know trips to the bunny ranch in reno you know (laughs) or anything like that but at least I've made myself laugh there. Anyway. <laughs> hey, if you tell a joke and you make one person laugh, it was worth making. Now, if you happen to be that person who is laughing, self-love rules say it still counts. There you go. Pat in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so I know one person, though, who will not be watching that Bob Ross documentary. Dr. Dre's daughter. Anyway. <laughs> the bad joke, bad joke. But, um... Word came out a couple of weeks back. Just, just get to the story. Just ignore the joke and get into the story. It, it's yeah. all good. We're healers here. <laughs> Thank God for editing. But um, yeah, a couple of weeks back, there was an article that came out that um, billionaire hip hop artist and producer, Dr. Dre, his 38 year old daughter with uh, his grandkids were living in a car and that she had not been able to contact Dr. Dre in any way, shape, or form. This is the same Dr. Dre who has gone on record as stating that he wears the shoes that he wears, he are are brand new every day. He never rewears the same pair of shoes, yet his daughter is living in a car. Now, granted, she's 38. She is an adult. Um, Just because he is a billionaire, doesn't mean he has to permanently support his uh, daughter for the rest of his life, but this has left a bad taste in some people's mouth. Now, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I don't know shit at all about Dr. Dre. Um, You know, as my other role, because I wear, I'm a tea of many hats, as Tim and I were joking about before we got on the show today, I'm still very much involved in the hero circle, which, you know, is constantly having the discussion about parental alienation. I do not know the relationship there. Uh You know what I mean? Because it doesn't sound like he was very involved in raising this child. Um, And that could either be because he skipped town and didn't want to, or if I I, I don't understand the story there, I guess. I don't want to make any accusations, so I'm just going to leave it at that. I do realize that that could be why he's not involved in his kid's life, but I don't know that story. And if he has never been involved in this person's life, I don't understand why we have this weird, mm, I guess it goes back into our cultural like opinion on familialism that that there's some sort of obligation to treat blood family a way in spite of whatever your actual relationship is like and whatever your dynamic is like i have no idea what this i mean where is this woman's mother is she gone has anybody looked into that because see there's two parents here who could potentially and hopefully help somebody not be homeless yeah um there's also usually you know uh something that my my brother has actually shared which is not one of the most sensitive things in the world is that you know you have to really have no friends in the world to end up homeless which is not true i'm gonna throw that out there that it is way more complicated than that but yeah like it's interesting that there is this expectation that just because he's rich that he should feel obligated to now granted considering it seems like it would be a drop in the bucket to do something as small as 
you know what, fill out apartment applications and find something. And here is a year of rent, right? To the man that can't wear two shoes twice, right? You know, maybe that would be a drop in a bucket and it would be like a good faith humanity type thing to do but it's just interesting that we'll put somebody's head on a spike because they are wealthy and nothing no relationship with a child who is now homeless versus if he was just some nobody guy that was this person's dad um we wouldn't care we literally would not even be talking about it right now so uh, it's just it's interesting to see these things play out when it deals with famous people. But, you know, one handy suggestion is, you know, Dr. Dre, you could just send your shoes to them. And I'm uh-huh. sure she could make a killing off of shoes that you wore for a day, I guess. I don't know if he's got a recycling program with <laughs> Nike or whoever it is that he wears. Um, but, you know, it just seems like people would maybe pay top dollar for some shoes that you wore once. So On eBay, what, yeah. Uh, if it's trash to you... <laughs> You may as well just let somebody else make a dollar off of it. But I don't know. I, I could see the argument of it's a drop in the bucket of, of his finances and it would be something, but it goes back to, I have no idea what their relationship was like, what it started as like, they're, yeah, we don't know the situation at all. I mean, it's like, sh- she is 38, you know, at a, a 38 year old in theory, should you know have enough skills to be able to take care of themselves on their own now granted we are in a pandemic these are extraordinary times even you know there are people that you know that during the height of the pandemic not through lack of trying were just not able to work so you know it could be a situation with that now also on the other side we don't know this daughter This daughter may have a long history of drug use. This daughter may have a history of stealing. This daughter may have a bad interpersonal relationships with him. And maybe it's just, he's doing it out of tough love at the moment. It's like, I, it's like, I, 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 we can't, we can't fill in the blanks for what we don't know here. So it's like, I have a hard time knocking him, but I also have a, I have a hard time 100% defending her because it's like, it, 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 to me, as a parent myself, you're a step parent, so I think you you get this. And my kids are older too, so I mean, my oldest is 20 now. God damn, um, yeah. Um, and it's like you want to help your kids, even if you know you haven't talked to to them in a while. But you know, if they are adults, if they do have that ability, you do want to encourage your kids to to do that first themselves. Again, not don't know all the details in this case, so it's not you know I'm not going to try and give my opinion per se on on whether I think Dre should um, you know pay for his daughter or not. To me, I just found it interesting that that people were already taking sides and people clearly were taking sides based on what the article said not you know anything else you know just because he has that ability doesn't mean he necessarily should because there could be valid reasons why he's not doing that now if he has the ability if she is homeless through no fault of her own and just needed a little help up yeah he he, you know because he's a billionaire you know, it's like he yeah. could se- he could sell like five percent of his stocks in Apple or Beats without a sweat. Give that to his daughter and say, you know, get back on your feet. You know, and and, and she'd be fine. You know, um. So it's 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 you know, it, there is a part of me too though that that is that that does feel that you know it's kind of like the, the superman and dc thing you know i brought up before how the superman creators sold the rights for only 130 dollars and you know they tried to fight for it over time but ultimately um you know the moment they were destitute in the 70s that's when dc started paying them thirty thousand dollars a year essentially to keep them quiet i mean situation like this maybe it, it'll happen that way too i don't know but it's like one People in our position reading this story do need to take a step back, take a breath and, you know, ba- make the make make your judgment, I guess, based on the facts that are available. And we don't have all the facts on this case. Now, yeah. um, I, again, I, I want to make it clear if all the facts do come out and it shows that Dr. Dre is just being a callous asshole and not helping his daughter when she really needs the help, then fuck him. But we don't know all the facts. Yeah, it's like, because, you know, my number one question always when it is a child that, you know, is saying that they are related to somebody famous, 
especially if that child has not ever really seeming to have been raised by the person or anything like that, the number one question is going to be, is that really their baby? Because it's not like you were there to say, yes, my mother did get, you know, the big D from this person. You know, I, it's just, it's interesting because I know that there have been people out there who exist, whose parents maybe aren't the most honest and maybe make up stories sometimes about who their father is. There are shows that make fun of this concept quite a lot. Um, I think there was one where somebody like believed that Alex Trebek was their father. And I, I almost want to go find it now because I know it was either a show or a movie where it's like, uh, yep, my mom said that was my dad. <laughs> and uh, and I'm not saying that that's the case at all. It, again, it goes back into, I don't know anything about this human, but yeah. I do know that we do have a tendency to, as, as a culture. So I'm not blaming anybody in general to respond to triggery type headlines and stories and not ask all of the relevant questions. Like, first off, is this actually his daughter? And secondly, what was that relationship like? Was this one of those things where the mother said, you're useless, go away, I don't want you involved at all? Um, and in which case, I mean, I don't know, I would still, as the type of human I am, still want to help this person. Uh -huh. And just throwing it out there that, yeah, she's homeless due to, you know, drugs or whatever. Well, there's still an opportunity to help with that. It's called maybe get them some treatment and help them out because it is no secret that our mental health system is kind of fucked right now. And it's hard to get help. So uh, to me, that's not a good reason to be homeless. And it's still nothing that doesn't warrant help. Right. So I don't know. I hope he looks into it at least. Yeah, and and to to be to be clear, fair on the direct thing though, it's it's like, you know, I have known people. I think we've all known people. You know, if if you know if, if you live in Portland, you know, um, that that do take a lot of drugs, I guess. And ultimately, when you get people that do that, especially the heavy, heavy drugs, you know, if, if they get to the point where they need help, they're the ones that need to ask for it, essentially. So if it is a case, if it is a case um, that, that you know, she has a history of drug use, which I'm not, I'm, I'm only, this is just speculation. Um, but if she does have that history, you know, and, you know, and he's tried to help before, yet she's still back on, yet she's still on drugs. I can understand where he's like, she has to learn on her own, you know, even, mm -hmm. even, even though she has kids. Now, now, one thing I want to make clear, I didn't uh, say about the kids, the article that I read from the Guardian did state that um, the, this woman's kids don't live in the car with her. The kids are staying with friends. So at least her kids do have a regular roof over their head. So uh, that is good there. But just um, at the end of the day, I hope Dr. Dre does do the right thing by his kid because that is his kid. But um, I, I, having said that, because this news is out there, I would challenge people that are reading it, myself included, to take some time to find out a little bit more information before you come to that opinion because i you know we've only heard one side of this and i don't know if we're ever going to hear the other side i don't think we just we don't necessarily deserve an explanation from dr dre's side of things you know because at the end of the day just because he is a famous musician and producer doesn't mean he has to tell us everything about that happens in his private life you know um but but just take some time to look at all the evidence don't make an assumption based on one article you read or the title of the article that you read wait for the facts exactly and then just because i want to put this near the end of this topic just as a disclaimer mm -hmm. uh we've only read the article so i realize we speculated a lot on the what ifs of the situation but i just wanted to bring it back no we don't know if there's been a paternity test no we don't know if she's had like what the situation is that led her to living in her car we just had some fun story times and i hope that was appreciated by everybody and then <laughs> the last little fun story time i wanted to throw out there about this because in 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 not having facts this is where I don't mind what ifing a little, as long as I'm very clear that I am what ifing a little bit. Yeah. But what if Dr. Dre is fully aware of this fan he had about 38 years ago that was obsessed with him? And just he doesn't want this to be the way that this poor human finds out that A, he's not the father, and that B, 
maybe mom had issues, but that's, that's the end of my storytelling. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to perpetuate anything <laughs> until there's more information, but basically, yeah, we don't know. What if there's a paternity test? First of all, I think he's going to look like an asshole to everybody, even if he asks for one, which is sad. Yeah. Um, because he should, right? Like, shouldn't he know if that's actually his kid, like before well, he makes a decision or should he just like, no, do I think it just because of pressure of society based on the articles that I've read, I don't think we're talking about a situation to where he is just finding out that this woman exists. I think he right. already is aware. Uh, I, I think, I, I think it is clear that this woman is his daughter. That's, that's how I read the article. So I don't think it's, it's a case okay. uh, of, of what you're saying, which, which has happened before, you know? Um, so it, it very much is a thing of, like you said, you know, just somebody wants to glom onto a famous person or feel like they're close to it so little billy you're you're related to william shakespeare yay you know no <laughs> exactly so let's let's see what story what real facts come out of this instead of story time and uh yeah we don't need to hashtag cancel dr dre yet not yet i mean he has done some bad stuff you know just oh, yeah. j- just google d barnes and you will know what i mean there was i'll tell you what the story is it's the d barnes was um a hip-hop uh music journalist in the 90s and um there was one point in the 90s where dr dre physically beat her up just just smacked her around and just uh, you just the yeah and yeah. It, it it was very bad and i you know he had some legal issues because of that and then eminem on one of his albums made a joke about it <laughs> you oh know? man yeah i yeah. So, I Doctor. So, 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 so. To be clear, I, you know, I through all of this talk that we've had of Dre and and his daughter, you know, I don't want to give the impression that I, I think Doctor Dre is a saint. Doctor Dre is a human. He's a complicated human. He's done good things. He's done bad things. I don't think he and I would ever be friends, even if our paths were ever to cross. But um, you know, again, without the facts, you can't you can't come up in, with an opinion without all of the facts, because at that point, you're just a jackass or a Republican. So anyway, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You were at a seminar last time uh, we spoke, you were going to it. And I'm sure the audience would love to hear an update. Fill us in. Yes. So I was able to go to a webinar. Um, let me actually pull up the name of this individual. So I don't sit here and, and stammer through shit like I do sometimes, but essentially it was hosted uh, alongside with forks over knives. Um, and it was featuring Adam Sud. and Adam Sud is somebody who was extremely open about his story and how it started with being prescribed Ritalin and later turned into a full bore addiction of all sorts of things. Um, It was really kind of refreshing and there is a playthrough publicly available. So for anybody out there who is kind of interested in these sort of things, I am going to share it with the nerddom. I'm gonna try to share it. Maybe we can make a discord channel that's just for links of stuff that we we talk about in the show, but um, wouldn't be a bad idea, I guess. But he, it was interesting to watch. Now, I have already mostly leaned over to the plant-based diet as part of that cortisol management routine I've talked about. I am a person with CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I have anxiety and depression and some other things that love to glom on to that um, because that's the thing with some of these diagnoses is that sometimes they do coexist very easily together. So mm. that's where I was pulled to listen about recovery and the effects that changing your diet can have on your ability to heal, like not just physically, but possibly mentally. And so this gentleman goes into his story and I guess, uh, you know, I've talked about forks over knives before. There's also like steam engine diet. That's actually the son of one of those doctors. And I guess, well, I mean, the reason was, is because our firefighters, like, most commonly die from heart attacks than they do anything else. So it was actually a spinoff, so to speak, of the plant-based diet, like trying to bring awareness to why being physically healthy is important for that job. Uh Like it is sad to lose them for that reason. Uh, So he's really tried to kind of spark a movement to get those those people in those jobs, like thinking to be more healthy to their body. 
because if you are good to your body, you will be good to the people you are trying to rescue. So he did talk a little bit about that. Um, I thought it was interesting that he went to some getaway, uh, like a retreat type thing that talked about the plant-based diet for healing. And it wasn't for years later that he finally even decided to try it. So he went on this little thing. He learned about it. He left. He stayed back in his habits. Uh, and I think the most impactful moment that I had, because, you know, he's talking about addiction to drugs, right? And going into rehab and things like this. And there was a moment that he was talking about when he was just switching over to plant-based and he knew he wanted to do this for his physical health and his mental health and to possibly help him recover from drug addiction. And he was talking about as a grown man standing in his kitchen crying because he knew he needed to pick the oatmeal but he really wanted his fruity pebbles. And so uh, that wow. really kind of put me into an interesting perspective, right? Because this is a man that is also talking about fighting addiction to drugs. And it kind of goes back to how we can get addicted to bad food, you know, and it's often, it looks like overprocessed, way too much sugar, you know, Tim Pepsi. is pulling up a Pepsi <laughs> right now. And granted, I had my coffee and I've got my, my little pleasures too that I'm working on cutting out so that I can see if it can have a real impact on my mental health. So he tells all this story and I'm waiting for the actual study to come out because that was sort of the big thing with this webinar was there's a study that's being released and what they did when I, and they talked about it some that was kind of cool is, I mean, it's no secret. I think most people that are even basically familiar with AA or anything to do with recovering from any type of addiction is it can be a really good tool to establish routines for yourself, to get into new hobbies and do things of that nature. And something they did here with this study was it wasn't blind, right? There was no placebo or control group because, I mean, I, that's not how they did it. But they did have an open conversation of if you did want to do a plant-based diet after you did like a certain part of the rehabilitation treatment, or if you wanted to just kind of go with the flow, so to speak, do what the normal thing is, whatever you want to call that. And what they found is that people who did switch to the whole whole foods plant-based diet were more likely to not have those regressions and were able to get, it seemed more out of their therapeutic environment in rehab. Uh, so again, I'm dying for the actual study to come out because to have somebody talk about it is cool, but I am one of those nerds that I just really like to read how it was done and all of those, some such little details that people tend to gloss over when they're trying to make a presentation out of things. Cause most people find it boring. I don't know. Maybe it's because I was a psychology major for a while and reading, you know, psych stats and learning how to like counter opinion bias is something that I personally love reading about. And in the studies, oftentimes they will let you know how they try to account for certain biases and stuff. But yeah, it's kind of hard to tell somebody, oh, that's not a plant-based burrito that has no chicken in it because they don't do the faux meats. So there was no way to really do this blind study, which is by preference. Right. Um, but yeah, so a lot of interesting conversations on there. They even took some questions uh, from the group of us that were watching it live where they could. I didn't really have any. I was more just kind of enjoying the, the story that he had. But yeah, um, I will gladly share the article with the replay. It's worth a watch. I also kind of cut out sometimes when it comes to people's questions because I wanted to know what that human had wanted to convey. Um, and I, I ran out of time because so it was just kind of getting a little bit longer. But if you want to watch the meat and potatoes of it, I found it extremely interesting, especially if you are one of those humans that, I mean, really a very fitting term for me is I am biohacking some of my issues, as I like to call them, my, my depression, my anxiety, my CPTSD symptoms. I am attempting to biohack those over taking medication. 
and seeing what I can do that's within my control that's possibly a little bit more cost effective. And plus, like if the if it's eating a healthier diet, it's just gonna make it cheaper for me, like in the long run where it can with getting help medically. Like, you know, I guess apparently, you know, your heart starting to shut down can start to get expensive if you're not taking care of stuff. So yeah. and other little issues with your body that can happen, like diabetes and things that I'd like to avoid. Um, yeah, so I, I will probably nerd out again a little bit lightly about this once I'm able to sink my teeth into the actual study paperwork. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the, I mean, that, that is the thing about uh, healthy eating too. I know ever since uh, moving in with a professor here, um, my diet has gotten considerably better. I mean, the fact that I'm, you know, drinking Pepsi zero and not just regular Pepsi is a big improvement. <laughs> um, you know, so hi, hi, high five. <laughs> well, Actually, that's almost like I got some bad news for you, because depending on what kind of sweetener is in there, there is like an increased chance of stroke every time you have one. Just throwing it out there. They, um, I, I will totally yeah. find that. But it's there's a study that they had just finished. And it was an article I was reading um, about some of the artificial sweeteners in your soda. But that's oh kind of why like, I liked um, uh, the, my soda stream, because I could just add whatever flavors I wanted. I know it's not the same as Pepsi, though. Like you probably have to work really hard to replicate pepsi taste but, yeah i mean who knows maybe they have the same re I, I, yeah i think the recipe is kind of like uh state secrets like uh the colonel's 12 uh, uh 12 herbs and spices or something like that um but um but yeah with uh it, you definitely got to be mindful of the food you eat because you know i know the times when i've um you know been at my worst in, in my depression and my eating has you know consisted of like you know double quarter pounders with cheese and a four loco yeah <laughs> it kind of makes that depression just it kind of amplify it and make it much much worse so oh, um, yeah, yeah it, and, it, and throwing it out there the opposite is also bad like not eating and under eating can also take a major toll on your mental health um mm -hmm. and just even how your brain operates like did you know this needs fats like there's so much research about how the fat-free diet really kind of messed with a lot of humans' brains because our brain legitimately needs fats. So mm. it, it can be bad to overdo it and it can be just as bad to underdo it. So take care of your bodies, guys. Like really, you don't have to pick the plant-based diet or anything like that. I know that's what I'm going with. And I do try to provide some form of updates on how that's going. Um, yes. But yeah, take care of your bodies. It's super important. You can even check out our food porn channel on Discord. <laughs> yes. And if we do have enough people that seem to show interest in, you know, I, I'm, I love taking pictures of my food. Uh, it kind of goes back into if you create a new habit or a new hobby that it can make something, you know, a little bit easier to, to get into. And for me, it almost reframed cooking as being a craft. And it kind of started to make sense why people share pictures of their food, because it looks good. It looks pleasing. And food is like something that almost everybody is interested in. So, but I guess if we get enough interest on there, I may start recording some cooking with the Reverend and show you guys how uncomplicated eating vegan can be because a lot of people just, they feel like it's a huge life change and granted it is easier to baby step into, you know, like meatless Monday is a pretty cool creative idea to get started, but I don't know now that I've kind of been doing it for a while. It's kind of funny that even I used to think that I would need a reliance on fake meat and fake proteins and fake stuff. And then what's funny is with the forks over knives way of eating the whole food plant-based concept is you don't do that. That's overly processed stuff. And that's the thing you want to limit. Yeah. And if, uh, I mean, and at the end of the day, if Eric Cartman supports it, you know, then maybe it's not that because there was a whole South Park episode on uh, the fake meat where they did a play off of uh, there will be blood and they had a guy, I'm a ghoul man, you know, <laughs> just making the vegetable goo stuff. But anyway, anyway, enough about that. Let's talk about OnlyFans. <laughs> yes, I saw your notes about it. I'm just going to let you talk about this one because I haven't followed it and, and your notes uh, made me giggle. So take it away, Tim. 
Yes, um, it, it, there was an update as of today. Um, a few days back, OnlyFans announced that in October, um, they would no longer host sexually explicit material on their site. And um, that does not mean that there, there wouldn't be nudity, but it must be considered artful or tasteful or something like that. And apparently this was at the behest of banks. Now, to be clear, OnlyFans is kind of like Patreon in a lot of ways. Um, it does have uses beyond the sex route. However, most people use it for sex. And that's that's yeah. not the end of the world. That's that's fine. Yeah, you know, it, it's it, got its demographic, and there's no problem with that, right? It's like Craigslist versus what Backpage or whatever. And Backpage, I guess, will still allow, or it used to back when I lived in Arizona. You could still do postings for guns and personals, which is something that, you know, so it's kind of become like the guns and personals version of Craigslist. Yeah, you know, I this fans yeah. only just really seem to draw that. Yeah. And it's like with the back page, I, I don't, first of all, I don't know if back page is still around. I think that may have been a victim of the FOSTA SESTA law that came out a couple of years back, which um, was against human trafficking but it's one of those laws that was made by christian groups that at the end of the day ends up uh you know getting getting legitimate porn sites shut down and um <clears throat> you know that's that's what people thought they were kind of facing here now word uh did come out um i did read a verge article that there was a bbc investigation into only fans and they found that the only fans people um you know they they would when it came to the rules if you were uh, an only fans member you know pr providing content for people to pay and you made the only fans people a lot of money you got a lot of leeway in terms of how many times you could break a rule before they finally put their foot down meaning there was illegal sexual content on their site that essentially they allowed because the people putting that content up there were making them a lot of money Gotcha. That seems kosher. Yeah. And that's the big problem that I have here, because uh, the way I see it is this. If there is a company that is willing to put on consensual adult sexual material and put in place guidelines to make sure that that is the only content that is going up on that site, they're going to make a lot of money. Yet we hear we hear from OnlyFans. We've heard it uh, with Pornhub when uh, they had their controversy a few months back. Unfortunately, these sites continue to want to allow, to blur the lines in terms of what the rules are, in terms of letting people break the rules. And it's like I have no sympathy for the 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 shit being thrown at the fan for OnlyFans for letting this slide. Because if again. If we are talking about illegal sexual content being uploaded on the site and OnlyFans did nothing about it because these people were making them money, they deserve to have the problems that they have. However, what this did, that that little dalliance with, with the rules of, of not following them hurt legit hurt potentially could have hurt legitimate people that were using this that were adults that were you know only that were making legal content and selling it to people that legally could get that content that put them in danger now now word did come out today that only fans has gotten assurances from the banks that sexually explicit material can continue to go on so you know hopefully this means that there will be Hopefully, this means that there will be stricter enforcement of the, the type of material that should not be put up there. But my fear is that because of the FOSTA SESTA rule from a couple of years ago, um, you know, you're you're having more and more legitimate sites for adult sexual content that are just being taken down just cause. And that is wrong, especially in a pandemic when a lot of these uh, people, male, males and females on OnlyFans that are making this sexual content, they are doing this and and it's it's basically become their only income during during the pandemic and the fact that you know they were going to shut it off with little over a month you know that, that sex work is work whether whether you whether you're comfortable with pornography or prostitution or anything like that or not is irrelevant it 
is work and it should be treated as such. Now, one thing that did, um, it was a, a Twitter article that was uh, retweeted by uh, Aubrey's <clears throat> other partner, Bear, uh, that, that pointed out that the difference between this and the Pornhub thing from a few years back, the good news on this is that if you read a lot of the articles, it seemed this time journalists were taking the time to actually speak to sex workers. And because of that, it, it ended up putting a lot more pressure on OnlyFans to make the switch, which they did do today. So that is good that we have this situation to show that sex workers are being listened to. But, um, you know, sex work is work, people. Whether you like it or not, it is work. If you if you are at home and you've ever watched pornography of any way, shape or form, you are enjoying the work of sex workers. And, you know, there was a meme, I think you put it out there of, of um, or somebody did on the group page of, you know, like one person, like it was like two blocks. One was like only fans being shut down. And then like, then your daughter starts asking you for more money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, it's like that, is, that could have happened. And, and would you want to think your daughter is not really a worker? I mean, as a father, yeah, I'd be really uncomfortable if I found out my daughter was doing stuff like that, but that doesn't mean it's not work. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'd be more uncomfortable as a parent knowing that they're doing stuff like that with no legal protections for the work that they're doing, because as much as I don't necessarily know if I would want to hear about my child having sex or anything for money, but that's just because that's not something that I would do. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? But that doesn't need to come from a place of judgment just because it's not something you would do. Like I was a professional cuddler there for a little while and it was amazing how much that creeped people out that I was able to cuddle with strangers. Like, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. I'll hug somebody the first time I meet them. So to me, it wasn't a far cry, but it was really interesting how quick my brain was able to take away from that. It's like, Oh, I think this is like my version of how I don't understand how people have sex for money, but that's me. And in my relationship to sex, not everybody has the same relationship to sex, which is kind of the point. Yeah. But I did want to say really quick, I, I looked it up really fast. And I guess in 2018, um, the CEO, Carl Ferrer of Backpage, um, agreed in his plea agreement to shut down the site and give data to law enforcement. They like had a lot of problems, by yeah. the way, with Backpage, just as a whole other side note. But if anybody was just like really at the edge of their seats, like, oh, my God, what happened to Backpage? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not around anymore. But yeah, it, it had a lot to do with the uh, personals and stuff after, you know. Uh, Craigslist got rid of them. Yeah. And, and th again, it's, we have to be careful on the arguments that, that are being made here because the people that are the most for um, however you pronounce that, it's, it's a weird day. Um, but the ones that are out there most, you know, talking about human trafficking and, and, and stuff like that, they got a hidden message. You know, a lot of those, a lot of those people that are, that are coming out for that are, are supporting of like these Christian groups, like Exodus cry, I think is one of them um, that, that they're, they're real, they're real, Real, um, their real intent here is is to get rid of pornography and 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 come on. First of all, it's not going to happen. But second of all, making it to where, I, I mean, pornography is not going to go away for one. But two, if you get rid of the legit sources uh, that people have to make this, they're going to find other ways to make it as well, and it's going to be a lot less safe. It's going to be, I mean, because there, if if like OnlyFans did stick with getting rid of the, of the sexually explicit content. There are other sites out there that would let that would, that would still be able to pull this off. However, the, 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 the people putting up the content are not going to be able to make as much money and they may not be guaranteed to even be able to get that money back in the first place. We don't know um, how big or small some of these other companies are. And, and when it comes again to sex work, a lot, you know, if these companies do screw them over, there's nothing they can do. It's like a prostitute that gets robbed. I mean, are they going to go to the police? No, they can't. Yeah, they can't. And it even goes back into, I want it to be looked at because I don't want people to be taken advantage of in that way. It's not that I'm waiting for somebody to give the stamp of approval so I can go hooking. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the fact that sometimes all it takes is getting them to do it the one time. Well, if you get somebody to do something the one time and it's illegal, you now have blackmail fodder. 
So it can really making it harder to make it a safe, uh, environment and make it viewed as actual work can really leave that window open for that level of manipulation and taking advantage of people who felt like maybe they didn't have a choice. And not that that's the story of why people get into pornography, mind you, because there's a lot of people who get into it because they like doing it and that's what they want to do. And I think that's totally fine. Um, there's a lot of things that I think within reason that if it's something you like to do and it's not actually hurting anybody when being done, you know, you know, making sure example, like young people aren't mm -hmm. being brought in when they are vulnerable and able to be manipulated easier because yes, there have been porn stars out there who have started young, like and then you find out later that they eventually they apparently had child pornography out there and that can happen for different reasons because sometimes they do lie about their age like even mila kunis lied about her age to get on um that 70 show. 70 show yeah now there is in the 80s there was um are you familiar with the actress tracy lords yes i think i've heard this story but I, yes. I'm not as well versed on it, but I think I'm aware of this person you're about to talk about. Yes, because um, when you mentioned um, women that uh, got into porn at a young age, she in the 80s got into porn at age 15. Didn't tell anybody, came in with, with a fake idea at the time. So it's it sounds like for the due diligence these companies had to do in the 80s, they did that, but they should have done a lot more, you know. And the thing is, she made movies up until the age of 18. When she was 18, she made one movie under her own production company. And then when that movie was released, she announced that the, all the other movies she did was before she was age 18. Those movies could not be shown anymore, but the only one that could be was the one that she was with that when she, that she did when she was 18, that she was producer of, and she made a lot of money on that. And that did caused some big changes in the uh, porn industry at that point. Very good changes that did need to be made. So um, for legitimate companies that are out there, they will do a lot more than, you know, have you look at a license, you know, or something like that. They do make, you know, I, I am confident that if I am watching something on Pornhub, you know, the, everybody is of legal age at that particular time, you know, it, it, yeah. I'm sure people needed to know that, but, you know, um, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, yeah, it's so in terms of legit pornography, the legit porn industry, they did have that. To, they did have that issue in the eighties, thanks to Tracy Lords. It's you know, as far as something like that happening again, to my knowledge, it has not happened uh, again. But you know what we're talking, but the porn industry, thanks to places like OnlyFans, is, is is a lot different now because in the past it was that porn was just content creators. Now with something like OnlyFans, um, you know, there's a lot more personal connection between the performers and um, the people that, that are purchasing that content because, you know, with like the OnlyFans, you know, they, they it's, someone can just set up a, put up a nice setup in their bedroom and, you know, do whatever they want in there. And, you know, it, it's, it's not like creating a fake story or something like that it's a lot more uh personal and um th that's another thing too like like why would you want to take that away why would you want to tell a woman that they can't do that and then force a woman to you know consider you know prostitution and to where the only other option they would have would be to potentially hit the streets or find a pimp or something like that i mean i i don't why, uh, it's like if if people are going to want to do this anyway why not create a safe space where adults can do this and not have to worry about being hurt and if you don't like pornography don't fucking watch it yeah, yeah really i mean it's amazing how many people are the vote with your dollars if you don't like it just don't go there until it's a service that they just don't want mm -hmm. and feel some kind of resistance towards. I don't know. How about this? If people really don't like porn all that much, then they won't make money and then it'll go out of business. But if people like porn, we may as well make it somewhat safe. But yeah, there's, there's a very interesting lot of i'm sure religious people and religious yeah. organizations who want to harpoon this um because <laughs> they they are amazingly the underground of a lot of things that are being fought some of the religious groups so 
Yeah. So just when it comes to this, be careful of the voices you're listening to, because some of the people that are fighting for, um, you know, like I said, the, the sex trafficking and stuff like that, they're not coming from an honest place. They're not coming from an intellectually honest place. They are looking to um, impose their religious beliefs on you. And I, I don't agree with that. You know, I think the conversation here should be, we should hold the, the these companies feet to the fire to make sure that you know they are not incentivizing people to put up illegal content on their site you know and, and it's like if only fans did allow a- any sort of illegal content to continue to be uh in, uploaded on their site just because the people doing the uploading happen to be making the only fans people a lot of money that is wrong. That should be investigated. That should be looked into. Same with Pornhub. If the Pornhub people were allowing illegal sexual content to be put on their site, by all means, throw the book at them. But yeah. but let's not just completely you know incinerate the entire industry over the sins of a few. Let's make sure that the industry is being run properly and incentivize them to make sure it's run with you know, consenting adults. And I think, uh, and to be honest, to be clear, to be fair, and, and, you know, since we did have a member of the adult entertainment industry on our show in episode 28, the legitimate porn industry for the most part is going to be following the rules because I even saw on Twitter the other day, like they, um, they, there was a big announcement because I still follow D severe, um, the guest from our episode on there. And there was a big announcement that um, one of the uh, adult performers did get uh, tested and came back with an HIV and production shutdown across the entire industry until that was sorted out. That is a beautiful thing. You know, because sexual content contact can lead to STDs, and you know, it's like if 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 that production was not stopped, who knows where cross contamination could have happened, and somebody else could have gotten sick. So, you know, there are there are decent people in the porn industry that are doing their jobs. But you got a funny point. It looks like not really a funny point. Just something if people really struggle with the whole. But Tim, isn't that a good reason that? why we should stop porn i want to put it out there what else shuts down the minute they realize there's a contamination oh factory farming um some of the big slaughterhouses so it's really you know they've got their rules too they have to like Mm -hmm. if you have a cow with mad cow disease you can't just keep doing shit you have to take a minute and make sure that your stuff is fine. Look at these mass producers of some of our vegetables that are grown in uh, the kind of, you know, they only grow spinach in this field or whatever, the the more uh, business like agriculture. Same thing, if their bout of spinach gets E. coli, like they don't get to just keep popping out stuff. They have to stop and figure out the contamination. Uh And, you know, and that's much larger scale affecting things than somebody in the porn industry having HIV because in that product in porn they can't give it to the consumers now there is a chance that they can give it to the other actors and stuff and then of course in instances of prostitution because that's one of those things in the background of this conversation is should prostitution be illegal if there are ways to make it safe other countries have anyway but it's no it's very similar to that Um, I I don't see that as a valid argument for making, especially porn, illegal, especially considering they damage far less humans with contaminations than some of our factory farms do. So I just I had a funny little I wanted to relate that to something that if you if you're like e porn, like, yeah, but there's other industries that also have protocols to follow. And that's the point is that there should be protocols to follow. And if your answer is to make it illegal, then you're going to have less protocols to follow. And would like the Ford Motor Company at one of their factories, if one of their machines hurt a, hurt a person on, on staff, would they completely shut down that factory and just say nobody works again? No, they, they, they would temporarily stop production, fix that machine, put a safety guard in place and then resume because, you know, there's this thing of if you kill your workers, you don't have people that can make your product, <laughs> you know, so it's yes. it's yeah, so it's. 
it's it's a complicated matter it's just and we're, we're in this puritanical country to where you know it's, it's like you, like in the suicide squad it shocked me that there was a guy that showed his junk in that movie and it it, it whereas in europe you know guys showing their junk are probably on kid shows you know <laughs> and i'm being facetious there a little bit but you know in europe overseas they are a lot more liberal when it comes to discussions of sex or you know depictions of sex on their entertainment compared to america but um you know yeah we have to, yeah yeah we have we, to grow- we, we take dick shots seriously i guess because like i still remember in the cut when that came out like everybody was talking about mark ruffalo's cock like that was the topic of the, I was like, oh my God, did you know that he showed his penis? And I was like, well, I mean, he's got one. So I always knew that was an option. So I, I guess, you know what I mean? Like it, there's, there's very interesting little rules in our culture sometimes. And it's like, well, I mean, he's got one. So you realize it was always going to be an option that at some point it would be out there. It's just, hey, it's not important. So people got upset. But meanwhile, like the whole you know, you could show a woman naked as long as she had like 70s bush going on or, you know, you could show nipples, but not vagina, like couldn't bend yeah. over. Like there's all sorts of, weird, but you could show the frontal. So I guess like, I don't know, maybe men need to have like more bushier areas for that to be okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, like a 70s Afro popping out. Poof. <laughs> you know? They sell Merkins, so um, you can just make it a mankin. Just like put it over there and maybe get two. I don't know what the situation is down there because you've got more to cover than like the flat space that I would have to deal with if I were ever naked uh, on TV. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a new industry there. Hair club for men for your junk. How about that? Um, anyway, let's end things on some feel-good stories here before I dig a further comedic hole here. <laughs> That's okay. We're going to go for talking about people showing their junk to people not doing anything like that. Uh, I actually had found some two really awesome stories about children. So this is one of those flows of stories that maybe could have been arranged better by us before we got into this. So I I I, I came across some cool feel good stories and I will be sharing them here actually shortly. So before this even comes out, I'm going to go ahead and pop them up there. Mostly because like I don't want to forget But uh, just the general feeling out there of, man, kids can do a lot of stuff. It's another thing that I am a big proponent of is enabling our children to discover their interests and to discover the things that they can actually do, rather than having this weird thing that seems to be an overly protective, you can't do that, that's too hard for you, you know, type of mentality that I feel I've seen a lot. And that, that comes from seeing parents actually directly interact with their children. Um, I used to coach after school programs. So it is interesting how much a child is discouraged by a parent. So I wanted to share two really cool stories of kids who are just out there being fucking world changers. And one is actually about an 11 year old who has a strong interest in bees. And I'm going to just share this so you guys can enjoy it all for yourself. But 11 years old and helping us save the bees campaign and spreading awareness about the importance of bees and actually being talked about on like CBS. And I think it is amazing. So for more information on that and how you can support her particular campaign, I'm going to leave that link on Facebook. But the one story that was really near and dear to my heart was I saw five-year-old boy hikes Appalachian Trail with Skittles and imagination. And go ahead, Tim. Um, I, I was going to say the professor would be f- quick to correct you, Appalachian. Oh, Appalachian. Sorry, I am a, a heathen. Appalachian <laughs> Trail. Um, but thank you for letting me know how that person says it. Because just funny side note, like I love how people <laughs> say things differently like Mm -hmm. based on where you move, right? And one thing that me and the Mr. Reverend have is I say scenario and he says scenario. And anyway, (laughs) so there might be other ways to say it. I don't know, but Appalachian is what? Yeah, I mean, that's that's where she's from, uh, that part of the world. So they pronounce it Appalachian, yeah. Appalachian. So the Appalachian Trail, and he's only five. And it was really kind of cool to read this story because it goes to show that just because something is hard and has hard moments doesn't mean that that child can't take away positivity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure there's times that I have been mountaineering up mountains and I'm 
<sighs> and huffing and puffing and my face is red and I'm physically uncomfortable. But I know as an adult, because I know to verbalize these things, that in the end, it was really worth it. So it was kind of cool to hear little Harvey Sutton and his little interview responses about, you know, there were times that it was hard. There were times that they cried. I thought it was really great. Um, the parents talking about it was a very bonding experience to do this together because, yeah, there were times that their feet hurt like none other. There were times where it really took a lot of tears and motivation to keep going. But I thought it was great to hear about it. He started it just or finished it just in time to go back to kindergarten And man, don't you, aren't you normally jealous of the kids who have actually like really cool summer stories? So this is going to be that kid that has like a really cool summer story. But I also thought it was sweet and going out there to explain that the parents said that sometimes the best motivation they had for their five-year-old was tortillas with peanut butter and Skittles. So it might take some interesting ways to motivate kids to do things, but damn, they are some able little little humans if you just kind of believe in them and give them that support but I I can't express I hiked with my stepkids and we do outdoorsy we are very experienced people over things and yeah it's incredibly bonding um even my little man he did his first double digit hike he hiked just over 10 miles the summer right before we moved Uh and there were tears there was at one point but the first thing he said when he was in the backseat of that car was how proud he was so uh, I wanted to put it out there feel free to challenge your kids you know just have open dialogue and communication about it because there is a difference between a child crying and really hating the experience at the end of the day and a child feeling like they had a good challenge and yes there were hard parts of it but pushing through and still being proud at the end and encouraging that kind of thing in our kids more more outdoor time maybe a little yes YouTube babysitting Yes, and I, uh, as a parent, I know how easy having the electronic cheat there available uh, can be, especially during highly stressful days. So I'm not going to knock any parent that that does that because some days you just want to relax, and the only way to get the kids to calm down is putting on some Dora the Explorer or some, something like that, you know. Yeah, and, and throwing it out there, I did not say never do it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm not saying you just said that. Yeah, part, yeah. Just, just more versus baby less. Like it, it's it's good to get outside. There's actually a lot of other little studies about just health wise what it does to be outside. There's also some promising and cool stuff to read about. Even taking kids to visit like a farm or a petting zoo type thing, or taking them to volunteer at one of the, like you can totally volunteer and take care of the cats at PetSmart. Just throwing that out there. If any of you guys have a kid that really thinks they want a cat, just have them sign up for that with you and make sure they're the ones scooping the litter box. Um, But yeah, like there's there's other ways to expose children to, to different environments and things. And being inside a lot isn't always what's best, but I just want to put it out there. Kids are incredibly able And if you want to take up hiking with your kiddo, like some of it is just getting into it as a family together. Because no, a child might not know or even think to tell you. It's like, I'd really like to take up an outdoorsy lifestyle and a good hiking habit. But, you know, you can also try a variety of things as a family and see what you like together. I I just found it super endearing that this family, mom, dad, and five-year-old, because that is no joke. These, this is something that adults train and take time off to go do, sometimes months. Um, so uh, it was a neat story. Very, very positive. I love when parents believe that their kids can, can do anything. Yeah, so the next time I have to muster up the courage to walk to the fridge to get a new Pepsi, I just have to think of this kid, you know, things shut the hell up. <laughs> like, that's, yeah, that's five feet. This child went like probably days because uh, yeah, there's camping involved. So but it's not a short trail. It's not something that you necessarily get dropped off of. Like you go, you go a ways. And I'm sitting here thinking, can I get an Uber for that? No. Um, <laughs> anyway. Tim, I Ubered the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I have a cater too? Um, but anyway, thank you all for listening. I think we'll wrap things up. This is episode 198. The next time we record is going to be episode 200. Yes, I am mostly prepared with what I want to say. Yes, yes. Uh, 
Me too. Like for the, for uh, we're gonna treat the episode two hundred primarily as just like any other episode, you, you know. But um, I will definitely have some nice things to say. Um, yeah. So uh, I, yeah. I mean, the fact that we got the two hundred is frankly amazing. The fact that we this past Monday had our four year anniversary is amazing as well. Not many podcasts can can say they've gotten this far. Yes. And then didn't we make a top list somewhere at some point? Maybe these are the things that we can talk <laughs> about on the show. Like we got an award. We got, uh, we were big somewhere for a second. And I was like, wait, where? Oh yeah, we um, did. <laughs> it, there was another podcast based out of England that did a podcast awards. And, um, you know, we, we got nominated and we got fifth place, um, not out of five, but, um, but the fact that, you know, we got into a top five list, um, th- 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 to me, I think that that says a lot. I mean, again, we don't have the biggest audience at all. Don't claim to, um, I would love to, but you know, and th- that's what we work towards. But the fact that, you know, we did get that recognition was really good. And, and, um, you know, I think with our last episode this past Saturday with, uh, Matt Wadsworth from Absolute Intense Wrestling that um, got a lot of downloads uh, for us as well. So I was definitely get, glad we had a chance to interview him. So, um, you know, the future of the show, as far as I'm concerned, is looking really, really good. Yay. Maybe we'll get big enough to offer like little tchotchkes. We can make pins. <laughs> I don't know. Let us know if you want pins. Maybe we'll look into pins. Or t-shirts. I mean, we can talk about this off the air, but there are comp- there are companies out there like T Public um, that uh, w- they're essentially a creation on demand company. So all you we would have to do is provide the logo, but um, we'd be able to open up page on there, and then um, people would be able to buy a t-shirt, and then they would only make that t-shirt once somebody makes that order. So so we're not in a spot to where we buy ten thousand t-shirts and then they all. Collect like dust you know yeah cafe press i think that was what my brother used to use back when he still did uh, the how to be awkward comic yeah which i guess are... is still up places like <laughs> he let me know it's like i guess that's still up he just doesn't do it anymore but yeah cafe press is another one like that yeah there are a number of, the, of them out there so I, and that may be something we should do because i think if we did it and then started trying to sell if we have something to sell then maybe people would want to buy something i don't know <laughs> maybe yeah would you wear a friends talking nerdy t-shirt let us know (laughs) i'm a big pin fan because you can like take and leave those or stickers put that on your car yeah stickers on the car that's great that's not hard to get off later what (laughs) Yeah, well, the bumper sticker for a reason, you know, <laughs> but um, anyway, so uh, yeah, Wednesdays and Saturdays, you know, you know, the spiel, we're going to have something in this podcast space to entertain you. Um, anything else you want to say to our listeners before we wrap up? Did you want to uh, give the email address again for Fearlandia? Oh, yes. If you are interested in being one of my minions, you can please email me um, to save me a little bit of time. If you do have any prior experience, just go ahead and start off with that. If you're curious, like, what do I say in this email, the Reverend Tracy? That's what you can start with. Um, But that is fearlandiacasting at gmail.com. Okay. And again, um, that will also be in the show description. So if you are in Portland, Oregon, or will be in Portland, Oregon during the haunt season and wish to uh, contribute, just tap on the email address. It'll take you to your email provider of choice and you can send uh, the Reverend an email to be a part of the show. Exactamundo. I am excited to hear from people. Yes, and uh, with you being in town, it, we will. Uh, we've also have plans to do a live show at the haunt, right? <laughs> yes, yes, we are. Tim is going to do the thing that I won't do. And he's <laughs> going to go through the haunted house. Yes, yes, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. So, uh, yeah, just uh, again. Just pay attention here to on Wednesdays and Saturdays in this podcast space. And we'll, like I said, have stuff to entertain you. Check us out on discord tech, check, check us out on social media. Um, if you like what you hear, subscribe, download, share it. Most importantly, get the word out. Yes. Um, we, we would we, love we, for oh, more listeners. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's like, we, we enjoy entertaining the many holes of your face for the other holes <laughs> on your body. You're going to have to go back in time and go hit up back page. An, or unless we get an OnlyFans page, but that's a different story. We're, we're not that dedicated. I could sell my panties on there. I mean, I heard that's a way you could go. I didn't know. <laughs> I just been throwing mine away. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, think about it. You know, make twenty bucks on that. Nobody wants my old tattered ass meat undies anyway. <laughs> <laughs> on that charming note uh i'll talk to you guys next week okay so we will uh, see you then uh have a good one now subscribe to friend stalking nerdy on itunes the google play music store as well as spotify remember to support friends talking nerdy on patreon goodbye darling